So uh, what I'd like to talk with you tonight about is what I said I would talk about in the notice that went out, which is a very simple method for staying in the heart even when things are aggravating. And I want to open that topic up or contextualize it initially and uh, with some information really about the mind-heart connection, our evolution, the vagus nerve complex, and a few other esoteric details, That all of which will have very practical applications. And then I want to open it up uh, in particular uh, to comments you might have uh, coming in through the chat. Maybe there'll be a chance for me to talk with someone um, here live. So I'm not going to give a long talk, uh, and I hope we can have some real participation here. So uh, the simple practice, which I encourage you to do right now, is to be aware of the area around your heart, if that's okay with you. And as with anything I suggest, if there's anything about that, maybe based on a personal history, that's scary or doesn't feel right, definitely don't do it. But if you can, Bring awareness to sensations in the central area of your chest. Some people are particularly sensitive to energies. I'm kind of in the mid-range of that maybe. Um, maybe even toward the duller end of the range <laughs> of normal people. Uh, so, you know, those of you that are more tuned into subtle energies, uh, you know, you might have a sense of slightly to the left of the midline, you know, where the physical heart is more located, or you might have a sense of a, of a kind of a circle or wheel of energy swirling in the center of your chest. Aware of that area. And see what it's like to stay in touch with or to return attention back to sensations in that area, often with kind of a background sense of ongoing in-touchness with sensations around the heart while you're thinking, talking, you know, getting things done. In ways that science does not really deeply understand, it seems clear that emotions that we typically associate with heartfeltness, lovingness, caring, um, sweet, tenderness, they seem to have some sort of relationship to the physical heart. And the reasons for that are not entirely clear at all. And I suspect that 500 or 1,000 years from now, we'll have a more of a scientific understanding of what the great yogis throughout history and other great teachers, shaman, mystics, and so forth have talked about when they talk about the heart, the radiant heart. But pragmatically, whatever the science of this may be, we can explore what it's like to be in touch with sensations in the heart area. And we can just explore what it's like to engage practices of calming and centering and opening that seem to be centered in the heart. To do a little bit of a nod out here and quick summary of um, heart rate variability, which you may already know about, it's a very useful piece of science. It's heart rate variability is just what it sounds like. In other words, the rate at which the heart is beating, even if it's staying steadily at 60 beats a minute, say, averaging one second per beat, the actual interval between the beats is subtly changing. Uh, so it might be something like even averaging one second per beat, you know, the duration or the interval between the beats might be one second, nine tenths of a second, eight tenths of a second, nine tenths of a second, one second, 1.1 tenths of a second, 1.2 tenths of a second, 1.1 tenths of a second, um, one second, and so forth, so that there's a variation. And research has shown that this variation um, is, um, uh, you know, associated actually with good outcomes. It's good to have some variation. In other words, within reasonable limits, high heart rate variability is, um, is, is good for us. And 
we can do practices that actually, uh, that have been developed by the HeartMath Institute in particular, um, we can do practices that bring us into a steady pattern of relatively high heart rate variability. One of the practices I like to do, I've adapted from um, suggestions from others, uh, is summarized in my book, Buddha's Brain, but the simple practice is this, and I'll take you through it right now. So step one, bring awareness to sensations in the area of the heart. And then step two, take three breaths in which you do a count so that the duration, the length of the exhalation is the same as the inhalation. So you could inhale two, three, exhale two, three. So on your own, keeping the duration of inhalation and exhalation roughly equal. And then in the third little step, bring to mind people you care about. Could be your pet, your friend, your grandchild. So while being aware, now we're bringing all three together, while being aware of sensations around the heart, keeping the inhalation and exhalation equally long, while focusing on heartfelt emotions. Okay, feel free if you want to keep doing that, but I and I think many, many people experience that within half a minute, there's a shift of consciousness. Feels pretty good, feels pretty good. Both strong and open-hearted together. Good. My friend Lily, asked me a question some time ago that is a really important one. And it has to do with how do we remain heartfelt? How do we remain open-hearted, compassionate, decent, benevolent, not letting people push us around, but fundamentally with good with goodwill to all beings, even if we disagree with them or are in conflict with them. Deep down, we're not cruel, we're not mean, we're not sadistic. So they asked me, you know, how do we do that with other people, depending on how they are, including they could be rotten to us. How do we do this? And in conversation with her, it helped me in a way express that we can imagine ourselves somewhat as like a, a Wi-Fi base station radiating just an energy field or resting in a kind of energy or, or field of fundamental calm benevolence that is not conditioned on who moves through that field. The Wi-Fi base station radiates in all directions whether there's a computer nearby to receive its signal. It just radiates. And this way of looking at it is wonderfully freeing basically says, hey, your job is don't be evil. <laughs> you know, your job is, you know, have a good heart, be good hearted. Uh, keep your eyes open, recognize people who don't seem to have good hearts and, uh, you know, take care of your own needs, but fundamentally just rest in a, in a radiant uh, compassion and kindness that's not uh, dependent upon what other people do. And when you do that, it's wonderfully easing 
it's relieving because that's all you have to do. You just kind of keep it, your practice, let's say, if you do this, and I try to do it, your practice is to bring good intent and your best game all the time, as best you can, with good wishes and an openness and a caringness and a decency, just as your standard of uh, being, your, your ground of being. And other people move through it. And uh, you might vary what you say to them depending on what's happening, but your fundamental stance of decency and good-heartedness is, doesn't change. See what I mean? This is a really interesting thing to develop. Now, this is a stance that we cultivate. Uh, I'm not perfect. Uh, little things might happen that <laughs> take me out of that hard place and uh, But then, you know, as much as we can with practice, we find ourselves resting in it no matter who moves through it. And one of the things that helps us to do that is to stay in touch with the physical heart, the physical heart. Uh, I've had teachers who talked about radiating from the heart in all directions. You might have a feeling for that. For me personally, it's more like just a feeling of basic kindness, basic goodness that's innate and flowing through and flowing out and opening in all directions. So in a little bit, I want to open it up for questions or comments, uh, although I have a couple more points to make. And I just saw a question that came in. Definitely, we record all of these, both on Zoom and this the audio, and then we post them within a couple of days. Definitely available. Okay. So I want to uh, offer one more uh, method that I learned a long time ago related to opening the heart. And I can't explain it, but I know it works for me you might find it works for you. And watch out, uh, some chakras are involved. So uh, the method I, that I learned was that um, in the chakra system, which others I'm sure understand better than I do, uh, the basic idea is that we can think of the body as part of an energy field and different parts of the body uh, kind of radiate different energies, may be associated with different emotions or qualities of consciousness and um, different colors. So if you know the traditional Hindu chakra system, and I'm going to grossly simplify it, <laughs> please be nice to me in the chat, um, is the seven chakras. So we have the first chakra down at sort of the root, you know, the pelvic floor, uh, the color red, and associated with raw survival, immediate survival needs, staying alive. Then moving up, second chakra, kind of uh, in the area between the belly button and the pelvic floor, uh, orange associated with sexuality and sensuality, eros, uh, procreation. Then coming up around the navel, the third chakra associated with the color yellow, um, associated with power and healthy use of power as well as unhealthy use of power. Uh, the sense of, you know, determination and getting what we need, making things happen. Then we have the fourth chakra, more in the area of the heart. And I should add, this, the third chakra is often associated with the solar plexus area underneath the rib cage. All right. Fourth chakra, area of the heart, color green. Fifth chakra, the throat, color blue, associated with expression. Sixth chakra, purple, the third eye associated with um, mystical insight, um, clairvoyant knowing, deep understanding, esoteric understanding. And then the seventh chakra, white on the top of the head, the crown chakra, whoosh, radiating and receiving in an upward direction. So here's the method. I don't know why I found it really worked. So the person who taught it to me said, when your chakras are open, they tend to open in a clockwise way. When they close up, even wisely to protect yourself, it's a counterclockwise motion. So you might like to do this exercise and whatever the esoteric explanations might be, think of it as a direct experiential experiment. So if you wanna do it with me, see what happens when 
you rub your hands together initially. Get a little energy going. Now, this all may seem way too 60s for you, but we're being scientists here, seeing what it's like. Evidence is evidence, including experiential evidence. And you might feel, if you put your hands together, almost a kind of resistance between them, like, like you know, the two north poles of a magnet, you bring them together, they're, you know, there's something there, right? Uh, and just see what you feel. Get a sense of that. All right. And then rotate your hand a, a few inches out from your the center of your chest, your heart area, in a clockwise motion. And you might have a sense of an energy there that you can feel. If you bring your hand a little closer, move it a little farther away, in a clockwise motion. And here's where it starts to get maybe really interesting. So as you move in a clockwise motion, let your hand go down over your solar plexus area. Awareness maybe of the color yellow, the sense of you know ego energy, power energy, determination energy, opening up. You're opening all your chakras now. And then your hand comes up and crosses over your throat. Blue expression, full expression, relaxed, full expression. Then your hand goes down and the circle is spiraling. It's getting wider. And your hand now starts to cross over roughly your belly area. The second chakra, the color orange, opening up sensuality, the life force, sexuality in a healthy way. Then your hand comes up, the spiral's widening and it crosses over your third eye, your forehead area, purple, intuitive knowing, insight. Then your hand comes all the way down and crosses over your root chakra, pelvic area, color red maybe, really opening up a primal physical vitality, surviving the animal who lives. And then all the way up over the top of your head, opening up the white crown chakra. And then if you want, you can bring your hand across your knees. Some people point out that there are kinds of chakras around our major joints. And then your hand goes really high over the top of your head. How do you feel? As someone is, you know, like I said, um, a little dull when it comes to registering energies, I notice that I feel more open, spacious, maybe a little spacey, a little dissociated, I don't know. By the way, people are writing in chats, feel very free to contribute what you know about this sort of stuff that I don't. And then we go the other way if we want to, because it could feel too open, maybe ungrounded to be this wide, you know, especially as we engage life. So we go in the other direction, counterclockwise. Okay. So we start out on the outside in this technique, and there may be others. So if you like, if you want, bring your hand wide in a counterclockwise direction over your knees. And then up over the top of your head, counterclockwise. If there were a clock on your chest, you know, how would the hands be moving counterclockwise? And then you bring your hand across your root chakra, sort of tucking it back into bed, closing it up, not in some tight sense, but in a healthy way. Then you bring your hand over your crown chakra, kind of putting a little bit of a lid on it. The spiral is coming in now. Then you bring your hand over your belly, second chakra. Then over your third eye, your forehead, purple. Then your hand moves over your solar plexus, closing that up. 
and over your throat. Give it like a protection, you know, a, a shield of sorts. And then over your heart in a counterclockwise motion, small circle. Recentering yourself. How do you feel now? Especially compared to how you felt after doing it in a clockwise way. Uh, I don't know about you, but I feel more buttoned up, <laughs> more centered, you know, not uptight. You know, it, it's not like that, but just kind of more contained, more grounded, more centered. Uh, I find around certain kinds of people, uh, I deliberately will do a thing where I will close up my energy field to kind of protect myself around them. Uh, in a funny kind of way, feeling more protected and can enable us to keep our hearts open with difficult people. Fences make for good neighbors, as the proverb has it. So uh, I want to really underline that I'm kind of a sci I'm a scientifically oriented and practical person, uh, and I'm not trying to make any exotic claims about what we did. I just, just think it's very interesting, and all I can say is that for myself, at least. I feel something when I do that. I don't know why I feel it, but I know I feel it. And I'm just in pointing out that that's one of different methods that you can use related to the heart, including if you want, opening your heart, maybe just in a certain area without doing the full exercise, just clockwise in the area of your heart to kind of open it or soothe it. Or maybe you feel like your heart is just too raw, it's too, it's being invaded, it, it's bleeding emotionally, you know, like emotional bleeding, not, not literal bleeding. So you want to tuck it up. So you go counterclockwise. Maybe you're with someone who doesn't feel safe with you. And you know, unobtrusively, even in a business meeting, you do little things like make a little circle. I'm just adjusting my button here. <laughs> make a little circle in the other direction. It kind of shields up, Scotty. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So I'm gonna finish here in my kind of talk. Uh, this might be a little unusual sort of talk. I don't know if you really expect Rick Hansen to bust out a chakra exercise, but there you have it. <laughs> I don't even know if it's a chakra exercise, but seems to seems to work for me. And I, more than anything, will, will hope that you basically take away, um, you know, right? Inclining the mind, a leaning into an ongoingness, a greater ongoingness of in touchness with your physical heart area, the chest area, as a way to help you rest in the emotions of heartfeltness or the stance or attitude of heartfeltness. That's my one hope for you as a takeaway. The second is that you, um, to a growing extent, keep you know inclining your mind, keep leaning in the direction of this notion of uh, your job simply being to rest in the heart, radiating in all directions, and other people will move through that field as they do. Do you see that idea? That you're kind of off the hook for what their reactions are. You're on the hook for resting in the heart yourself, radiant and open in all directions, omnidirectionally. It's a really sweet shift. So those are my two really major suggestions for you from all this. So I wanted to take a look at um, the uh, 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 comments that have come in and see if uh, I can uh, respond to some of them. And then maybe there are one or two people who'd like to talk about something, hopefully succinctly, uh, related to our topics this evening. So let me just see if there's some quick questions here I can say. Um, I think it's clear. Uh, when I mean clockwise, I mean as if there's a clock on your chest. And you can play around and feel it. You know, it, it may be that for some people, these things are actually different. So maybe for you, it goes the opposite from the way I did it, the way I was taught. Uh, but it's as if there's a clock on your chest. And you could just experiment, go in either direction and kind of see how that feels. Um, so I don't know if it matters which hand. Uh, I'm sure there are yoga techniques that are much more developed than this. I use my right hand because it's the one I feel, but 
might be interesting to do it with the left. Um, great. Okay. Let's see here. Anything to say? Great. Um, God, I've seen all these comments come in. Uh, this is great. Okay. Going to try to be helpful here. Where am I? Da, da, da. Okay, so I'm going to read a question that came in to me uh, directly, but I won't use the name of the person, but you'll know who I'm talking about uh, here, the person who asked the question. Here we go. Two-part question, but related. One, sometimes when sitting in meditation, an overwhelming, triggering emotion arises, like an emotional flashback. And that's a very common phenomenon, uh, very understandable, uh, partly because as we meditate, we become more open, uh, you know, things kind of sift down inside, we become more permeable, stuff can bubble up, all right? So the person continues, as meditators, we are often told to sit with the emotion and watch what it does, which seems to contradict what a therapist might say, which is to go into resourcing. If I do resourcing, am I still meditating? Very important question. Very important question. And two, in the midst of emotional overwhelm, oftentimes the heartfelt feelings aren't accessible. Any tips on how to access heartfelt feelings in the middle of overwhelm? Really wonderful question, right? Very generally applicable. Okay, first one. Uh, in certain kinds of meditations, as procedures or as, or as techniques, we can practice what's called choiceless awareness or bear witnessing. There are different terms or nuances about this, but essentially we're just sitting in Zen Shikantaza. We're just sitting, we're just being with whatever arises. We're not trying to nudge it one way or another. We're not trying to understand it. We're not trying to do therapy on ourselves about it. We're simply feeling it. Now, maybe there might be occasionally some insight into the nature of all experiences as we be with them, that they are impermanent, made up of parts, and arising dependently so that, in effect, they are empty of substance or identity and even empty of ownership. There's not a one who owns that experience. Okay? So... That's vipassana, that's insight into the nature of experiences, even in the midst of open awareness or choiceless awareness. But it's a very, as this person brings up, it's a, it's a very, uh, you know, just simply sitting with the experience. Okay. Now, it may well be that during meditation, the, uh, we're sitting with the experience, and honestly, it's not very valuable. I know this might be a bit of a heresy, but sometimes we can do open awareness, choiceless awareness, and the learning from it is pretty minimal. It's pretty flat. Maybe we can deepen in our groundedness and that process. Okay, and that's good. That's a very profound and important practice. But if, you know, if material's arising, it's not very fast in dealing with content. Now, one might say, look, the purpose of meditation is not to deal with your content, your psychological stuff. Okay. Uh, and some people take that as a very strong position. I get it. And maybe if someone has an opportunity to practice 24 hours a day or a lot of hours in a day, you know, that much open awareness, four or five hours a day, day after day after day, might actually be healing for a person um, and relieve suffering. If the point of it all is the relief of suffering and the point of it all is, is less suffering and more happiness, love, contentment, and wisdom and inner peace, well, if you're not getting much out of your meditative practice, why are you doing it, right? So I think it's okay in my own view uh, and it's not inconsistent with teaching with the purpose of Buddhist practice, which is to become free of suffering and its causes, um, to do both. 
to be able to do choiceless awareness and open awareness without having to fix your mind all the time and turn it into a big project. And for people like me who started out that way, choiceless awareness and open awareness is a fantastic procedure, fantastic orientation. It's good. I've gotten a lot of value out of people who told me, Rick, you're a pretty good therapist, including with yourself. Don't do that. See what it's like for this one-day workshop or this 10-day retreat to not do anything to manage your reactions and just simply be with them. That could be extremely valuable for a person. On the other hand, if you're sitting there and suffering arises and you're witnessing and witnessing and witnessing and it's still suffering, it's your call. It's your call. And some people might disagree with me, but my attitude is if it relieves your suffering, to shift out of a very receptive kind of inert stance of witnessing into more active engagement with the material, particularly in the container of meditation where you, there are a lot of factors already present that are, that are facilitative of, of healing, why not try that? Why not make that shift? And I myself have gotten a lot of value from starting out with a very established steadiness of mind and then 20 minutes in, something will bubble up. And because I'm very quiet in my mind, I'll be able to discern or detect some young material, some little residue. It's like your mind gets very quiet. The surface of the river becomes very still in the stream of consciousness so that you can see just the very tip of a little tip of a leaf poking up above the waterline, moving up into awareness. Uh, and you touch that leaf and you start to gently tug on it and the whole leaf starts to emerge and then you keep tugging and this deeper material from your own history, let's say, starts coming up or a deeper form of, of attachment or grasping or resistance and you start getting the whole twig and then you keep pulling, pulling, pulling and now you have a branch and eventually you get to the whole trunk of the tree of your neurotic material. And you wouldn't be able to do that except in meditation, right? But meditation is a fantastic opportunity to become aware of that material. And in through a process of awareness then, um, some healing with it, maybe some releasing of sadness or anger or shame or fear that's in that material that's kind of you know woven into the log as it were. And then maybe also there can be a, a, a release there that opens to something positive and, and loving and good and wholesome that can replace what you've been releasing in this meditation. So maybe you do that. Maybe you do that for a few minutes, for 10 minutes. Beware the pitfall of getting all caught up in projectizing about it and therapizing yourself, you know. But often there's a really sweet combination of a meditative spirit and frame inside of which there's some gentle, kind, helpfulness of oneself and guidance of oneself in the service of freedom from suffering and establishing happiness, love, and wisdom. So I think that's okay. That's personally okay. Now you decide what feels right to you. And I, I have immense respect for other teachers who may have different counsel, but uh, for me, I think it's okay to do both and to know what you're doing to know when you make that transition from the stance of bear witnessing and simply being present with what's there and allowing and shifting into something a little more active. Second, um, is that clear? I think it's very important what I've talked through here. Okay. Second, in the midst of emotional overwhelm, sometimes heartfelt feelings, you know, are not accessible. What to do? Uh, one, this is a technique you may know it from neuro-linguistic programming. When you're uh, getting in touch with your heart, including um, heartfelt feelings of lovingness and kindness and caring, you can anchor that experience by, through a physical sensation that you pair with it, you match to it. So I, for example, will touch the center of my chest because it is a fairly innocuous kind of gesture. 
Uh, I can do it in a business setting and nobody particularly notices. It also connects to the heart. And when I'm having a heartfelt feeling, I may touch my chest, which starts to associate the sensation of touching my chest or the gesture of touching my chest with that emotion. So then later on, touching my chest is a kind of cue that can help to surface that heartfelt feeling. So you might try that. You might try that in general. Second, there are different kinds of heartfelt feelings. When we're overwhelmed, um, you know, a kind of universal compassion might be way too esoteric and out of reach. On the other hand, when you're really hurting, when you're overwhelmed, is there not any kindness for yourself? Any compassion for yourself? Can you get on your own side? And do, is there that fundamental sense of, oh, this feels like crap. I wish I felt better. Oh, that's kind of heartfelt. That's heartfelt for you. That's you for you. That counts. And so you can focus on that way of orienting to or relating to the overwhelm, the sorrow, the rage, the frozen, like in the face of the abuse kind of feeling. And in other words, you can emphasize or, or be mainly aware of how, of how you feel kind of toward yourself rather than what the content is in the moment, the experience of the upset of the trauma. That's an, an example. Another one is a sense of people who are with you and reinforcing that sense of an internal caring committee, internal guides, internal allies, friends, companions, teachers, spirits, whatever, the divine altogether, who is with you, with you. I think <laughs> maybe foolishly of Dante's Inferno and Dante the poet went into hell with the angel Virgil by his side. Dante needed that companion by his side, his ally, to go into it. Who goes with you when the trapdoor to hell opens up for you? And um, so with repetition and with practice, we can have a deeply internalized, hardwired sense of allies, those who care, your friends, people who, who like you, your dog, your companion, you know, um, your lover, your, your mentor, who are with you as you deal with um, the overwhelm and bringing to mind the felt sense of being with the other is really uh, a powerful method. We have, in terms of developmental psychology as, as infants, a hardwired, baked-in capacity to have an internalized other, a sense of an internalized other, beginning with the most fundamental early caregiving experiences we've had and, and, and their physical sensations of comfort or or feeding in the mouth and so forth. So we're able to do that. We're very able to do that, to bring in the sense of the of the caring other. Um, and so that's another thing to build up inside and to know that you have the capacity to do that. We have to turn to it. So in the middle of the overwhelm, after we deal with the first wave and the shock of it, there's no replacement for being active ourselves in some ways in how we orient to it, including in terms, like I've said, of getting in touch with you know, your own good, good wishes for yourself, your own compassion and support for yourself, um, and also being active in the sense of getting in touch with others who might be with you. Okay. All right? Okay. Hey, anybody want to talk to me? Anybody want to use the last five minutes or so here? Question? And personal situation. Yay, I see Karen. Karen, you're the first person I see waving. So um, I think you have to unmute yourself. Okay, great. Hi, Rick. Thanks hey. so much. Good to see you again, Karen. Karen's one of the longstanding participants in our physical meditation group, right. along with a number I remember of that. other people who are here with us today. Remember that fondly. I was really curious, and I, I questioned this earlier. You talked, you touched on it just for a moment. When someone asks me to picture or think about love and loving something and loving someone, and I feel all these warm, fuzzy feelings, and I think about whatever people I love or parents or friends, it's weird that it happens right here. 
Like, yeah. why isn't it coming through toes or the knee or the elbow? Like, the heart's just another organ. Like, is yeah. there any more you can say on that? Because I'm just, I just think that's fascinating. I think it is fascinating. A lot of people have banged on that. And frankly, a lot of the theorizing I've seen about it, to me, is one, you know, it's speculative. And it's cool. It's somebody's speculation this, somebody's speculation that. But I'm I'm a little leery of telling a whole story about something that we actually don't understand really well. Uh, I, you know, the one thing I can imagine is that the regulatory systems that are very involved with the heart uh, through in terms of the vagus nerve complex and uh, so other systems as well but but one aspect of the regula regulation of the of the heart and the heartbeat um, is closely entwined with the vagus nerve complex one of whose as you probably know Karen one of whose main branches arises up goes up from the you know, the brainstem, and is very involved with our social lives, our social engagement system. So I, I can imagine somehow that relational feelings uh, that, that people have just simply start to have somatic markers that are saturated in this part of the body. Uh, and, and then they kind of build on themselves in a circular way. So we start out with some somatic markers related to the vagus nerve complex and its second branch connecting with the first original branch that heads downward to regulate the heart and the viscera. You know, that those sensations start happening around the heart. So then because they're already there in the heart or they're growing in the heart in this more kind of mechanistic way, we start to associate heartfeltness with that. And then we build up even more somatic markers in that area related to lovingness and kindness and friendliness and open-heartedness and strong-heartedness and, you know, brave heart and all the rest of that. Uh, go Mel Gibson, right? Brave heart. But anyway, and, um, and then, uh, and that be, you know, develops over time in a kind of circular way. Who knows? And then who knows what's really true in these ancient systems? I mean, those those yogis were onto something, <laughs> and and the shamanic methods from around the world, first people, indigenous people, they're really onto something. So maybe there's part of that too. I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, but that's a good question. Um, yeah, and I think Dan Brooks made a point. We culturally associate to the physical heart what are actually unrelated from the thing pumping away. You know, that are uh, actually more. You know touchy-feely things, but because maybe as well as Dan is suggesting we associate to that, um, you know, it uh, we, we project those feelings onto the physical heart. I don't know. Yeah. I know for myself that um, as someone who initially was very much in his head to defend himself and survive his childhood, which was not abusive, but was for different reasons, partly because I'm sensitive. I'm a sensitive person. Uh, you know, it was difficult. It was, really, it was quite painful, was sad uh, for me. Um, anyway, because I'm heady, as it were, I can go there and you know, intellect is trained. So we tend to go to our go-tos. We tend to use our go-tos, especially when we're under pressure. It's been so helpful for me to really strengthen um, the you know, the feeling of being in the heart, being in the heart, resting in the heart, you know, physically drawing on those somatic markers there. And that's, like I said, one of my two main encouragements for you from this, from this evening together to just really practice, you know, how many times a day are you in touch with being in the heart? What does that mean to you to be in your heart? And it's really important to be really clear. It's not about being a doormat to be in your heart. Um, You can see people who are fiercely effective political activists who are very much still in their heart. The Dalai Lama is a he's a political activist for the in many ways, and he's clearly very much in his heart. So anyway, being in the heart, returning to the heart, standing in the heart, resting in the heart, you know, what is that like as a regular practice for you? And how might that serve you, including in particular relationships, even? Uh, di even difficult relationships, they're doing their thing and you're sitting in your heart. 
You're not being pushed around. You're not wishy-washy. But you, you know, you're in your heart. And when you're in your heart, here's a really interesting thing. I, I came across this um, a very developed monk, Ajahn Amaro, who's an abbot now in England. I read an interview with him maybe 10 or 15 years ago, and he was asked what his core practice is these days. So you always want to know what someone like that is really focused on. And he said non-contentiousness. And that really hit me. Think of all the subtle ways we quarrel with others, if, if only in our mind. We think they're wrong, or we don't think they really appreciate what we're saying, or they're saying the wrong thing, or they're not answering our question, or they're talking about something that's not related, or they're doing it the wrong way, or you know, they're leaving a mess. We get contentious. And I find that when we do this practice of really standing in our heart, resting in our heart, one thing it does is it disengages us from a lot of needless contentiousness with other people. We make no quarrel with them in our mind. We, we let a lot of pitches go by because <laughs> we just don't need. It's like, okay. <laughs> you know. And maybe there's a little snark that we still indulge. I'll speak for myself like, whoa, man, it must be really intense to be you. But okay, you know, <laughs> Ooh, let it go on by. And be careful of disdain, subtleties of disdain or contempt, righteous superiority toward others. You know, when we're in our heart, we just, you know, we just, we just, we're, there's less fuel for all that. It tends to just dissipate immediately because we're just in our heart. Those reactions start to rise up, you know, but then they, whoo, settle back down into the calm pond of our own heart. That's what I find. And then second, just to remind you, see what it's like to orient this heartfeltness as like something maybe living through you or radiating from you or, or just a field a, that you're in through which others move. So your heartfeltness does not depend upon them. It's not the result of anything they do or say. It's the result of, of kind of who you are and how you are, radiating in all directions, opening, extending in all directions. You can even imagine that. Even like a light or an energy moving out from your heart in a sphere, kind of spreading in all directions from this origin point, if you like. Okay. Well, I kind of hope that wasn't this wasn't too weird. <laughs> I'd mean, I, I go full weird, maybe because I feel very physically grounded due to spending a week in the desert of Joshua Tree Park and camping and rock climbing and who knows. Anyway, how about we sit together for a minute or so just to wrap it up, let it sink in. You might like to deliberately join me and just being in touch with your heart, physical heart and emotional heart. And this there's trust here too. You can trust in your heart and trust that you have a good heart. It's interesting, isn't it, to have confidence in your good heart. You don't have to be saintly or perfect to have a good heart. Looking at your faces, I can feel your good heart. Hmm. 